on this episode of Citizens. We talk to Bill Swan, the creator of Faces of Pharmacare, an online database of stories to show fellow Canadians the faces of those affected most by our country not having a national drug plan. Stories that should never happen, but are happening, and the people who are suffering the most are not faceless. They're our family, our friends, and ourselves. The lack of a national health plan in Canada that includes drug coverage, or pharmacare, is a complex and multi-layered issue. To first get a better understanding of pharmacare, what it was, and what it can mean for Canada, I went to the Canadian Association for Health Services and Policy Research Conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia, to meet up with the renowned Canadian health economist, Dr. Steve Morgan. When did the idea of pharmacare first start in Canada? Yeah, the idea of pharmacare actually is as old as Medicare is in this country, uh, dating all the way back to the 1940s, when our federal and provincial governments were talking about what a universal health insurance system should look like for Canada. That original idea included universal insurance for hospital care, medical services, prescription drugs or pharmacare, as well as insurance for home care and dentistry as well. So all the way back to the 1940s, and certainly with the 1960s uh, report on uh, the Royal Commission on Health Services in this country, Medicare was supposed to have a prescription drug benefit as part of it. The plan in the 1960s was to do this in stages to develop. Uh, we already had universal hospital insurance by that point then medical insurance, and then prescription drug coverage and other components, maybe in the 1970s. Why do you think it hasn't worked? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've had students do their PhDs in political science trying to answer that, that question. So it's a very complex, and there's many reasons that Canada probably did not succeed where every other comparable health system did in getting a prescription drug benefit as part of its insurance system. Um, parts of the reasons relate to just the pace of change. Because Canada tried to develop Medicare in stages, one piece at a time, it actually left room for the private insurance industry to find profit in our sector uh, over time where other comparable countries like the, Euro the United Kingdom or other European countries, they didn't have that opportunity to get a foothold of private insurance in this country. So pace of change mattered because it created a big industry that would prefer to sell their product to Canadians rather than to have a, a public insurance plan for things like prescription drugs or dental care. Um, the other reality is, is that Canada is a complex federation. We have 10 provinces, three territories, and a federal government. And certainly, going back to the 1970s, federal-provincial relations were not particularly good. And for various reasons related to federal provincial politics, the federal government wasn't ready to take the next stage of Medicare, which would have been pharmacare in the 1970s. And unfortunately, with each decade that passed, the arguments for pharmacare became stronger, but some of the opposition to pharmacare got stronger as well. And that opposition came or comes from insurance companies that want to sell their insurance, but also drug companies that want to charge higher prices in Canada than they charge in other countries that have a universal pharmacare system. So what do you think pharmacare looks like in Nova Scotia? Well, Nova Scotia pharmacare is similar to what you might find in other provinces. The problem is that these drug plans, including the one in Nova Scotia, are the equivalent of a patchwork where certain people are provided reasonably good coverage, but many, many people are left to the private market. And access to the insurance in the private market is more or less a privilege rather than a right. And that creates problems. If you're relatively wealthy, working at a full-time job with an organization that's reasonably large, whether it's government or private sector, chances are you have extended health insurance that does include prescription drugs. 
But if you're not in a high income earning category or you're not working full time, or if you're working for a small organization, an entrepreneur, for instance, you might not be able to afford or your employer might not be able to afford to provide you drug coverage. And as a consequence, many Canadians, in fact, about 19% of Canadians report that they have no insurance, public or private, for the prescriptions that they or their family members need. Every high income country that has a universal health care system includes universal coverage of prescription drugs, and they do so within the health system that finances all ne medically necessary care. Mm -hmm. So all of these other countries did pharmacare with Medicare and hospital care and, and other services. So, and they all did this a generation ago. They all did this either just before the Second World War or just after. Right. So we're talking about a situation where Virtually every comparable country already does this. And as a consequence of doing that, as a consequence of having a universal public system for covering prescription drugs, mm -hmm. everybody's covered. Those countries do not have high cost sharing with patients for the prescriptions they need. So everybody has access to the medicines they need. Introducing universal pharmacare in Canada actually just comes down to spending the money that we're already spending on medicines mm -hmm. more wisely in a system that is more efficient and fairer in terms of where the money comes from. So pharmacare is about taking those different sources of money that are currently paying for, for pharmaceuticals, moving them into a, a comprehensive and coherent program that will actually buy more medicines because they'll be able to afford it at, at lower cost and it will be able to provide it for all people no matter what their age or income is. We're talking about savings on the order of between $4 billion a year and probably as high as $11 billion a year through a comprehensive public pharmacare program in Canada. And I think there's two reasons why the money turns out to be a problem even though in fact it's about saving money through a pharmacare system. One is an old adage in healthcare policy that is every dollar of expenditure in a healthcare system is a dollar of somebody's income. Mm -hmm. So when we say there's very good reason to believe that Canada would save billions of dollars every year through a universal pharmacare system, it means the people who are selling medicines at the prices in Canada that they could not sell them in other countries are thinking, wait a second, we could lose billions of dollars in profits every year that we're getting because we're selling our products at a higher price in Canada than abroad. The second reason that there is some opposition to pharmacare is a general distrust of government. Mm -hmm. Canadians and you know, people around the world don't love big government programs just for the sake of big government programs. I believe that Canada needs to hang together. Our provinces and territories need to move together on this file so that they're stronger against the inevitable opposition from industries that are making billions of dollars that they should not be making in this country. And they need to move together because with federal support, you ensure that every province can afford to participate. Next up on Citizens. I sit down with the creator of Faces of Pharmacare to find out how the project first started and why he thinks that this could be the key to a national drug plan for Canada. Bill started Faces of Pharmacare as a way to bring awareness to the issue of drug costs and privatized health plans in Canada. I was interested to know what had motivated him to start the project in the first place. Faces of Pharmacare, uh, I think, has been in the works for a very long time. Um, when, when I came out of university in 87, uh, I thought I'd be a big boy and go down and get drug coverage. Uh, I went to the, the, the Blue Cross office here in Halifax and I said, you know, I'm, I'm now a full-fledged member of society. I would like to buy some drug insurance, please. And they said, well, do you have any pre-existing conditions? I thought it was a reasonable question. Said, yes. They said, we can't cover you. And honestly, I went home and I thought about it. I, I, I just, it was, I said, this, this is crazy. And I went from being a, a, a very stable, severe asthmatic to suddenly stopping my meds. I couldn't afford them. And so I, I was in the ER by the end of that summer three or four times. And by the fourth time, uh, I'd had enough. Mm -hmm. I'd actually had a, um, a press conference with the leader of the NDP at the time to talk to the government and was, was completely incensed that they said, well, yeah, come on down, we'll talk to you, we'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. when my argument was that this saves money overall. If I'm not in the hospital, I'm not using ER, the drugs are cheaper. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Um, So I ended up with a thesis topic, went back to school where I did have drug coverage. Um, So it's always been in the back of my mind that, well, it's got to be cheaper to give people drugs in the first place rather than let them get sick Mm -hmm. or be treated in a hospital or what have you. And that's always been there. How have your experiences been as someone who deals with chronic illness on a daily basis? Well, it's it's so much part of my life that it's actually something I have to think about. Um, And to give you some background, I was diagnosed when I was two with severe asthma. And we suspect that I always had asthma because as soon as they started to treat me, I stopped crying. (laughs) But this, basically, I was one of two people in Nova Scotia. It was a toss-up between me and a guy named Dennis Mitchell, who was the worst asthmatic in the province. Um, So I spent, until I was 10, probably I was in the hospital once a month. The problem is, of course, is that if you look in my lungs, they look great because I've never smoked. You know, they're Mm -hmm. good-looking lungs, but you can't see what's happening by just looking at lungs. You have to go very deep to understand. So it's, for me, I'm a very different patient, I think. Mm -hmm. I take it really personally that I have to understand what's going on, that I need to take care of myself. I see that it's my responsibility to do the best with what I have. And where I get frustrated is I think society has kind of fallen down by, well, yeah, you go take care of your drugs too. Because there's treatments that I won't even bother looking at now. If if you're talking $35,000, $40,000 a year, I I can't afford that, even at 20%. Other way, I think it's shaped who I am. Because, you know, when when the government way back in 87 said, come on over, we'll take care of you. I got so angry that Mm -hmm. it kind of shaped me into this person that says, you know, the patient has a lot to, to, to do with their health and a lot to say. Uh, about three years ago, I, I got tired of the rat race that I was in. I ran conferences internationally, was looking around for something, trying to figure out what to do. And I looked at what was happening, and I looked at all of these instances of, you know, this is a great idea, the research is there, we should do this, and nothing happening. And then I said, well, there's never been a patient voice. Mm-hmm. So Faces of Pharmacare came out of that frustration. And so I set up the website and I I, honestly, I really didn't know what to do. You know, all I knew is that I could take a story and I could tell the story and I could do it very authentically. Mm -hmm. So I started with mine. I I knew that story. Mm -hmm. That was easy. Um, And I was shocked at how simple it was to find other stories. Mm -hmm. So some of them, I I just want to shout the story out, but I, you know, I'm trying to be very good about it. Uh, So really it just came out of a frustration with seeing the research lining up and making a very clear case for something and there not being the political will to actually make a huge difference. But I realized that the only way that this is going to be a winner is if if we can show a picture of little Bobby and make that connection for people, that this is not just some statistical person. Right. You know, it's... If you're walking down the street and you pass 10 people, almost half of them have a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And if 10% of people in Canada have little or no access to drugs, then at least one of those people probably has an issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is what I found when I was doing Faces of Pharmacare. I didn't have to go far to find people. They were right there. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of shocking to me is how close the stories were. Are you hoping that your stories will become a part of sort of a bigger narrative in a general sense? Um, Well, I I sure hope it does Mm -hmm. because I'm going to keep doing it. Now, I do know what I did with the with the advisor council. and, And to be clear, it's the it's got a really long name. It's horrible. The advisor council on the implementation of Pharmacare. And this was the council that was put together uh, by the feds to study how to do it. Not whether we should, but how to do it. And I actually approached them at a round table and I said, you need patient stories Mm -hmm. because that's how you're going to humanize this and really start to connect Canadians to other Canadians so that they can understand that, you know, pharmacare is important, not because it will save money, but it will save lives. Uh, And Steve, I remember Steve talking 
on one email, I asked him, I said, well, is there any research on how many people have died? You know, how's, what's the mortality impact? And he said, we have been trying to figure that one out for ages. So I, I looked at some research from the states that said there was a 5% mortality savings when they brought in uh, Medicare Part D, which is drugs in the states for the elderly. And I mm -hmm. said, well, if, if we had that, what would that mean in Canada? Well, I did the math and I figured out that over the last 50 years, we've killed Kitchener by not having access to meds. And then the Nurses Association follow, or the Nurses Federation followed up with a report that was had the similar sort of, you know, when, when we don't provide meds for diabetics, we kill them. So it's important for people to understand that this is not some sort of esoteric thing. We are physically killing people by not giving them access to the meds that will allow them to not die, to lead a normal life. Next up on Citizens, Bill shares some of the stories of the Canadians who are struggling with chronic illness. And we learn some disturbing truths about our current healthcare system. Faces of Pharmacare had been a work in progress for many years for founder Bill Swan. I was interested to know why he thought these stories can make a difference for Canada. The reason I wanted to get the stories out there is so that people would see that it, it is them if they're not careful. It's somebody in their family. How do you go about finding the stories to put on your website? Well, um, some of it is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. I have done things like do Twitter and Facebook ads. Um, I, I just keep talking to people and I keep leaving cards and I say, can I talk? You know, I, I'm just willing to talk to anybody about it. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's somebody that's patently against pharmacare, I will talk to them mm -hmm. to understand what's going on. Uh, so I, I did the, the patient stories for the advisory council on the implementation of pharmacare. Mm -hmm. And I was told by my contact at the council that the stories that I was bringing to them, they were shocked at what they were seeing and hearing. So I talked with um, a woman in northern Manitoba who, and it was one of the hardest days I had doing this project. So I was talking to her and trying to get her story and she started sobbing on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said, nobody's bothered to listen to me before, Bill. And to find out that in order to get help, this woman was expected to give the province her home. Wow. And this, these are the things that the council kept saying back. Is, uh, they kept on asking me, can you confirm this? Because it, it's so unbelievable yeah. that this would happen. There's a, another story I wrote. The husband was approached by um, the CEO said, I just found out we have a really co high cost individual on our plan and it's going to put our rates up. We need to find out who this is. CEO didn't realize that he was talking to the spouse of that person and that that person was spending a lot of money on this drug, needed this drug. And the CEO effectively said he wants to find out who it is and get rid of them. And it, he, when he found it, it was this gentleman. He got him fired very quickly. So here, here are these things that we think only happen in the States. Mm-hmm. No, it happens here. So imagine an employer has the decision over whether you're going to get drugs covered or not. You know, what's the point of a plan? What's the point of all of this private insurance when any opportunity to say no, they find it and use it and, and just get rid of people? And the problem is, and this is why I started Faces of Pharmacare, those stories don't come out. One of the stories that I really want to, to talk about that I don't yet have written is um, my daughter went to school with a young guy and he went to the, the hospital or the doctor. He had a sore knee and came back and found out he had stage four neoblastoma. Father's a serial entrepreneur. There's no insurance available for that. So they had to go and, and set up a GoFundMe campaign for a quarter million dollars to, to try to get the funds to pay for the treatment. Now, luckily this guy is, is doing fairly well, but this is the frustration. If, yeah. if we've got an economy, if we've got a government that wants to support entrepreneurship and wants to support the arts and wants to allow people to do what they want to do, 
why are we stymieing people mm -hmm. by ignoring so many people that can't get coverage that are just struggling to to cover their meds or they have to decide between food and and what have you and i don't understand how this kid's father and parents didn't lose their mind mm -hmm. and i think that's a story on itself mm -hmm. the the ability of people to just okay we're going to suck it up and move forward and to me it's none of this was their fault why right. are they paying and worse most of the money that they collect leaves the province because it goes to pharma companies. Mm -hmm. So there's no value economically either. If I was somebody who had a story, uh, whether that's in Nova Scotia or across Canada, how would I go about reaching you in Faces of Pharma? You, it's really quite easy. You email me, you call me, you send smoke signals, and I will find you and I will call you or I'll meet with you. But I do the work. So often, like the story about the young the young guy with the, the cancer, they didn't even know they had a story until I explained to them that this shouldn't be an issue. And it's, it's a story I wrote four years ago. Mm -hmm. Still as relevant as it was then. Um, so m my hope is that people will start to understand that by, by looking at these people, it's like the homeless. You know, you, you if you look at them, you humanize them. Right. And I want people to look at people that are dealing with the side effects of, a, of some bad decisions in our healthcare system and have to deal with it personally, where it, it really makes absolutely no sense. And I just hope that what Faces of Pharmacare will do will be to keep the stories of the people really affected at the forefront. I'd love to see the research kind of be, oh yeah, and theirs. I'd really love people to say, yeah, I, I I can completely relate to this person. I can understand that that could be me tomorrow. Yeah. That's where I'd like it to go. I actually know somebody that has a personal story, my mom, whose name is Sharon. I was wondering if you'd be willing to sit down and, and talk to her and kind of show her the process of how she can use Faces of Pharmacare to talk to politicians, MLAs, um, MPs, to sort of get her story out there to the public. Absolutely. I, I will talk to anybody about this issue at length, un unceasingly. Uh, but what I think is really cool about this is exactly something that I mentioned before, that how, how close these stories really are. Mm -hmm. Here we are recording, and the person involved is saying, oh, look, there's a story. I just, it's right there. Yeah. This is how close this, the stories are. And, and this is what I want to sort of broach, is to say, I want you to understand how close this is. Mm -hmm. This is right around the corner. This is the next time you take a step, the next breath you take, this is going to happen to you. And, and what I think is interesting, and I'm kind of excited about talking to your mom, because once people realize what their story is, they realize they really have something to say about this. Thanks so much, Bill, for sitting down and talking with me and sort of showing me the ropes of how it is with Faces of Pharmacare. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm happy to do it anytime. Living with a chronic illness will change you. If you've never been sick for an extended period of time, you can't imagine what it looks like, let alone what it can cost. No one should be forced to choose between food and the medication they need to survive. If every other comparable country has successfully implemented a national drug plan, then Canada should be no different. But we need to stand together. Join the fight with Bill and the other faces of Pharmacare. You can share your story, write to your provincial and federal politicians, and talk with others about this critical national issue. And join us next time on Citizens as we get a chance to talk with some of the faces of Pharmacare.